doing that, let me go ahead and do the usual boilerplate stuff here at the beginning. So welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Physics Department Speaker Series for this autumn 2020. And we're continuing the November Speaker Series and its theme of new frontiers in physics, which we're definitely going to hear about one of those today. And I'm going to hand things over in just a moment to Professor Fred Olness to actually introduce our speaker. But before we get started, a reminder to our audience on Zoom that uh, we've got you all muted so that we don't get the talk over effect that Zoom is not very good at handling when everyone's mics are opened up at once. Um, but if you wanna ask a question, just put in the chat that you would like to speak, just type the word speak and we'll notice that and we'll interrupt Miguel at the next available slide boundary or if it's during the Q&A at the end, which we'll have at the end of the presentation, then we'll make sure to get to you next as kind of a little speaker queue like we've done in the past. All right, and uh, we are simultaneously recording this on Zoom and broadcasting it on a live stream on YouTube. So welcome to our viewers on YouTube as well. That's non-interactive, but people can watch it there in a pinch. All right, let me now welcome Professor Fred Olness to introduce today's speaker. So welcome, Fred. Okay, very good. It's a pleasure to have our friend and collaborator, Professor Miguel Olita, who's a faculty member at the University of California, Riverside. And uh, before his position there, he was a postdoc at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And he did his PhD studies at the University of Cambridge. And before that, he studied at the uh, University of Santa Maria in Chile, uh, which is where he was born. And he's been a member of uh, ATLAS, ALIS, and class collaborations at the LHC and Jefferson Lab. And uh, we're also proud to say he's an alumni of uh, the CTEC School. And so he's going to be telling us today about uh, jet tomography, the proton at the future electron ion collider. So Miguel, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, th thank you for the opportunity to present uh, today. I appreciate it. So today I am going to discuss uh, prospects of future measurements at the electron ion collider, which are centered around uh, the goal of taking tomographic images of the proton. And I will explain you why, what I mean by that in a bit. But first, before talking about that, let me just tell you that um, our modern view of the proton um, really was, really started uh, after the experiments that were done at HERA, which is, um, an accelerator that was that ran until 2007, just before the LHC started in Hamburg. And it was the first and only electron proton collider. So in a sense, it was also an electron ion collider. So the ion in this case was a hydrogen ion. And it has um, it had a center of mass energy of about 320 uh, GeV. So those experiments uh, really did um, fantastic job in studying deep in Alaska scattering, which is the process that I am describing in this slide, uh, where I'm showing you the, um, the diagram on the left-hand side. Uh, I, there is a, some concepts that I, I, need you, I need to explain and that will come over and over again in the talk. So in this diagram, uh, you see the electron um, is here in, in, in green and that uh, interacts with a constituent of the quark, uh, constituent of the proton, which is shown here in red, uh, with an exchange of a virtual photon. So the, we characterize this process with two variables, uh, two or more variables, but there are two that are rather important. Uh, one of them is the Q squared, which is a transfer momentum squared um, uh, that is related to in a sense, the wavelength or the resolution power that you get when uh, when you exchange this W, uh, sorry, this uh, photon, virtual photon. And there, there is another variable which is called X, which characterizes the uh, momentum fraction that the, the, squat, the scattered quark carried uh, from the proton momentum. So those two important variables are will come again and again. And what HERA did uh, was to measure this reaction in, um, in events like look like look like this. So this is a transverse um, transverse and longitudinal view of an event is, of an event an actual event in with HERA data. So you have electrons going from left to right and protons going from right to left, and 
uh, the, the one quark is scattered out of the proton, but that um, quark in itself will not be measured, but rather all the particles that are the product of, of the quark uh, fragmenting. That's a process of fragmentation. Uh, where at the end, what we measure are a bunch of particles going in the, in the struck quark direction that we call that a jet. That's what you can see on the upper part, now, upper part of the figure. And recoiling against that is the scattered electron. So by measuring both the scattered electron and, and jets, you can do all sorts of measurements. Uh, but uh, by and large, the measurements of uh, HERA, are the most uh, uh, consequential, uh, let's say, uh, where measurements where you, you could in principle do just by measuring the electrons. And by measuring that, by changing the angle at which the, the angle and energy by which uh, the electron is scattered, you can map the X variable and the Q squared variable and map the density of, pro, of, of, of quarks inside protons, the, the density of quarks and gluons inside protons. And uh, Hera did a discovery, which was the, the, the um, gluon density uh, did, uh, does rise quite uh, a bit, uh, quite rapidly when you go to lower and lower x. So uh, the proton is filled with um, gluons that have low, that carry low momentum of, of, the, of the proton. Uh, and those gluons are, 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 are particles that uh, play a rather important role in the protein structure. So after this discovery or modern view of the proton looks like more what you can see in here on the right hand side. So at high energies, you can really resolve these fluctuations that actually play a rather important role in the protein structure. So before, uh, before these measurements, uh, there were uh, there was indications, but there were not clear evidence that the gluon density really is very large. What you can see in here is shooting uh, is 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 going off scale, and you can only access uh, the low the low x region when you have increased energy. So that uh, really um, I would say changed our view of the proton. Now before we we had the uh, indication that the proton was mainly um, the three quarks that carried a large fraction of the momentum and then maybe a few gluons here and there. But now we believe that the gluon density plays a, a rather important role. So this is, this is what is uh, illustrated in this artistic impression of the, of the proton. So it's, it's really a complex system, a many, many body system of quarks and gluons that conspires to give us the uh, proton. So that really, that discovery in, in the header times really did set the stage for a new collider, which is the electron ion collider, uh, which was uh, right, right from there, um, uh, the, the ideas of having an electron ion collider are around that time. Um, and the, the main uh, purpose, as you can see from this paragraph of the idea of an electron ion collider, uh, is to build up upon the HERA discovery that the gluon plays a rather important role on the on the proton structure and to really study that in more detail. And that is what this is, uh, project is about. Uh, so there are various physics measurements, that, uh, areas of physics that, uh, that will be a, we will be able to pursue at the electron ion collider. And they have to do with how the spin of the proton is carried by gluons and how those gluons and quarks are carried in uh, momentum and position space. So what is the structure of them? What distribution of those inside the proton? And, and there are other topics which uh, I, they are very interesting, but I, I will not talk about today. And they have to do with possible hypothetical um, new forms of matter when you increase the gluon density enough and also how quarks and gluons interact with, with the nucleus. So those are probably the four main pillars of the AAC science program. I will focus on the first uh, two ones uh, that have to do with the, uh, uh, to try to understand the spin of the protein and, and how the quarks and gluons are distributed inside it. Inside it. So, uh, so the big picture questions, questions questions that we want to answer is, um, what is the origin of the proton spin? I mean, we know the answer. We know what is the uh, spin of the proton, but, but we don't really know how that originates from 
the quarks and gluons that are inside the proton. We know that the proton is not a, f a fundamental particle. So uh, how the quarks and gluons interact to give us the spin that we measure is, is something which remains uh, mysterious. And that can teach us, learning about that will also teach us uh, the uh, strong force dynamics that are occur that occur inside the proton. Uh, along the same lines, you can ask, what is the origin of the proton mass? So most of the mass of the proton is coming from the, uh, uh, not the mass, the fundamental mass of the quarks, uh, but rather from the interactions of quarks and gluons. So it's like a kinetic energy and, uh, and the interaction between those. That is what gives rise to the uh, proton mass. Um, so that's an open question right now, uh, wh where that is coming from, what is the dynamics that emerges? that leads to an emergence of mass. And there are many other questions, like what is the shape of the proton and what is the um, internal properties of the proton, like uh, pressure inside the proton? Uh, many, many other questions that remain uh, unanswered, but those are all related to uh, this view that I, that, I sh that I showed you before, in which now the proton is a more complex system than we used to no, we used to think about it. So on the left-hand side here, I'm showing you a cartoon that that was more or less the understanding of the protein structures like in the 80s, like before the HERA discoveries. And, and most of, the, most of the, uh, the, the, the expectation was that uh, most of the spin of the, of the proton was coming from the spin of the fundamental quarks that are inside the proton they're aligned in a, in a given way that they add up to give you the proton spin. But now with the gluons, we know that uh, the, the gluons uh, do carry uh, some fraction of the proton spin. And, and this is a much more complex phenomena because now we, we, we think that the gluons also play a role and not only the gluons, but also the orbital angular momentum of quarks and gluons might also contribute to the net proton spin. And, and so that it gives rise to more questions and uh, understanding this more complex phenomena is uh, what, what is one of the key goals of the electron ion collider. So in more technical terms, what this is about is uh, the goal is to perform a quantum tomography of the proton. And this is not just a buzzword. Um, it's really uh, just, to quantum tomography in the same way that you could find quantum tomography in other fields of physics, like in quantum chemistry or in cold atoms. Uh, what we want to do is to measure the Wigner function. So that's what you do, a measure a phase space density. Uh, uh, and, and you can do that in this uh, other fields in physics. And you can also define that for uh, quantum electrodynamics. Uh, sorry, quantum chromodynamics, which is a quantum field theory of uh, of the strong interactions. So you, the Wigner function you can define for the proton as well. So that is the ultimate goal because the uh, Wigner function will, would allow you to know many things. Uh, the, it will allow us to know what are the quark and gluon densities inside the proton, uh, what are the orbital angular momentum of them, what and not only that, but also it will allow us to get a handle on the quantum level correlations that occur. So you can have spin orbit and spin spin correlations and, uh, and many other interesting uh, quantities. And by knowing that, by knowing the densities and, and in, in both momentum and position space uh, and also correlations, you can uh, hope to we hope to elucidate what is the origin of the proton spin and the size and the magnetic moment and the mass and the pressure and the shear force inside the proton, all of which uh, originate from the interaction of the quarks and gluons. So that's the ultimate goal. So it's a Wigner function, uh, but the Wigner function is a highly dependent, uh, it's a highly uh, dimensional problem. So. I should have said this before, but I, I am defining here the Wigner function, which is defined here in terms of the wave function and uh, uh, defined in the usual way. So it's a phase space density that depends on X and P. And this is a pseudo phase density in the sense that it, it, it really uh, holds, it doesn't break the uncertainty principle. Okay, so this is of course bounded by quantum mechanics. Um, and 
Uh, and so that's a highly dimensional function. Uh, but what we hope to do is to break this problem into many dimensions. So this is what I am illustrated in this figure is illustrating in the sense that instead of tackling directly the phase space density, which is in, in, in 5D, uh, you actually can, can uh, uh, take projections of that. So you can either project in momentum space or in position space. And furthermore, you can integrate some of those dependencies and, and, get, and get different functions that are actually related to the, to the global mother function, which is the uh, Wigner function. So you can have things like uh, the uh, transverse momentum dependent uh, distribution of quarks and gluons and also other functions that depend on position. So uh, by taking this approach where you break the puzzle in different dimensions, then you can piece that together to find the Wigner function, which is the ultimate goal. So let me just tell you that uh, in order to do this, uh, we need this uh, new collider, which is the electron ion collider. Uh, and the, the main features are that the electron ion collider will be, uh, will have much higher luminosity than HERA. So up to a thousand times more luminosity, which allows us to really do more precise measurements of more rare processes. It will have a variable center of mass energy and the energy itself will be, um, lower than the energy at HEDA. Uh, on the other hand, that is compensated in part by the fact that the electron ion collider will also collide not only uh, protons, but also uh, uh, nuclei. Uh, so it will have more, uh, uh, there is, there are more um, there's more flexibility in the experimental setup of the experiments that will run at the EAC. And moreover, and very importantly, uh, the electron ion collider will be the first collider in which uh, the uh, protons uh, will be uh, polarized. And so you can have protons coll colliding with electrons. Um, and that is not a feature that uh, was present at HERA. At HERA, the, the, the electron proton collisions were unpolarized. The, the proton was not polarized. And now the electron ion collider will have that and it will enable a, a bunch of new studies. And so I'm going to describe that to you uh, today. So jets are produced uh, with uh, jets that in an experimental point of view, they look like what you can see on the right hand side, a bunch of particles going in the same direction. And so that's the jet that is like in a cone, green, uh, yellow cone, and they recoil against a uh, high momentum electron, which is the uh, red line that you can see on the right hand side. So in the theory, you can describe this process on, like in the left hand side, where you have an electron coming in, an electron coming out, exchanging a virtual photon, and then scattering of a quark inside the proton, which later fragments, produces other particles that go in the same direction. So that's uh, the jet production at the EAC. And this is rather uh, uh, important because the jet EAC, uh, a collider will be um, a jet factory in the sense that many jets will be produced. And this is not something which is um, uh, unique to the electron ion collider. Basically every collider has produced jets uh, abund abundantly. That's what colliders do. And or most of what they do. And, but what is going to set the electron ion collider apart is that uh, the, 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 the EAC will produce the first jets in nuclear DIS, deep inelastic scattering, and in proton polarized deep inelastic scattering. So that will open up new studies that were not done before, uh, completely qualitatively different. It will open up a completely new uh, uh, field of, uh, or, more studies, completely different studies. So in particular, you could, uh, one of the studies that we will be able to do with uh, protons that to, if we are able to control the polarization state of the protons is a studying a spin orbit correlations. And this is illustrated here uh, where you have an electron that is colliding with a proton that has a spin a sp it's a spin pointing in a given direction, then you can, uh, if you study this reaction, you, you get out an electron that is recoiling against a jet. So that is what I showed you before, this type of uh, events. If you look at the electron 
and the jet in the transverse plane with respect to the beam. The, the beams are here shown. Oops, I don't know what happened here. Uh, so you have the uh, electrons recoiling against the jet. And if you measure that precisely, uh, you actually are sensitive to spin orbit correlations of quarks inside the proton. And, by, and basically what these correlations uh, uh, do is to induce a small changes in the back-to-back -back imbalance between the electrons and the jet. So this is those, if you measure the imbalance well enough, uh, and then you change the polarization of the proton, you will induce a change. And that change is proportional to the spin orbit uh, cor correlation that is inside uh, the, of the, pro the quark inside the proton. And that allows us to uh, really measure, measure, measure this thing in a, in a rather direct way. So you could measure the strength of that correlation. And that goes by the name of a Sievers function. And this is illustrated in these two figures, uh, so what this is showing you is the strength of the um, of the uh, spin and, and quark momentum uh, correlations. Uh, so, what you can as a function of the momentum that um, that that uh, that the quark has inside the proton. So, this kx and ky tell you what is the transverse motion of quarks inside the proton. And when you have, when you have, um, when you change the polarization of the state of the proton, uh, this induces some as asymmetries that can be measured. So this function, we believe that is going to be different for u quarks and d quarks inside the proton, and we need to measure this precisely uh, to be able to tell how are both they how. They are distributed inside the proton in 3D, uh, but also what is the correlations uh, that are inside? Uh, what, how the, the quark's uh, momentum correlates with the spin of the proton? And this type of experiments have been done in a variety of, uh, of, of, of experiments, mostly at fixed static experiments. So uh, experiments like pictures I am showing you on the right-hand side, uh, different experiments and over many decades. Um, so one of the uh, questions that you might have is why why we need the electron ion collider, and the reason is that it, the electron ion collider will really open up a phase space that was not available before. In a similar way that what HEDA did, uh, like um, change our view of the proton. Um, when you don't have polarization, just if you just measure the, the distribution of quarks and gluons inside the proton, that's what Hera did. The electron ion collider will, on top of that, uh, will actually uh, allow us to do uh, 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 to take a look at the transfer uh, spin nature of the proton. Um, and by uh, with that, uh, this is illustrated here. The dots are existing data, and 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 the dashed line are future data that cover a rather limited uh, space in x and q squared, which are the two variables that I described to you before. When the, with the electron ion collider, depending on the energy, we will increase dramatically the phase space that this uh, of the existing data. So the uh, amount of information that we will gain about this um, process uh, will be tremendous and similar, in my opinion, um, to the 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 the, the way that Hera really opened up uh, uh, and uh, and made discoveries, uh, the Hera experiments made discoveries. We really should expect this, something similar happening in this case, where you have spin of uh, control of the spin of the proton. And what is more important uh, for this talk is that the collider era will really bring new tool, a new tool which is jets. What I showed you before here. This is what a jet looks like in a in a, a potential EAC detector. This is a simulation. And so initially, when the uh, electron ion collider was being proposed, uh, like uh, ten years ago, uh, uh, most of the plan or the proposals uh, were around uh, the idea of measuring one particle at a time, not really measuring these jets of particles. Um, but we know now that a jet will play a rather important role. And there are various reasons why that is the case. 
So jets are excellent proxies for quarks and gluons, the kinematics of quarks and gluons. So we cannot measure quarks and gluons directly, but we can measure jets. And, and those jets have actually uh, give us a, a very good idea on what was the direction and momentum of the scattered quarks. So this is illustrated in these two diagrams where I showed you uh, the momentum distribution and angle distribution of, of, of electrons as struck quarks and jets. So electrons are in blue, a struck quark is shown in purple and jets shown in red. Uh, and so this is a distribution that, um, that you can see from the purple to the red, they match rather well. So if you measure jets, uh, the, the hadrons that the particles that uh, that uh, are that uh, that that form the jet, you can actually re reconstruct the struck quark kinematics, and this is something that has been known for a while. It was exploited at HERA for a variety of studies, and this is one of the main reasons why we want to measure the jets, like uh, overall a spray of particles rather than one particle at a time, and the technical reason. Uh, has to do, this is of course related to this uh, picture that I'm telling you that the quarks are, are rather related to the jet kinematics. Uh, but in more technical terms, um, when we uh, measure uh, rates of reactions, like uh, cross sections, um, what we end up accessing is a convolution of two terms, um, which is the term that we want to take, which is this F, uh, fa factor that I am showing you here, uh, but it's not alone. It's in a convolution that uh, involves other functions. So that's the technical term. And the way that I like to explain it is that uh, we want to take a picture, but that picture is actually blurred uh, quite literally. So uh, is you have like a, a, a blurring kernel uh, that you want to, you need to deconvolve to actually get into the picture. So this is similar to what we have in astronomy, let's say, oops. In astronomy, uh, where uh, in astronomy, where you um, what you measure is not really what is in there because there is a point stress function in your instrument, and you need to do the inverse of this problem to to really reconstruct what is actually uh, out there, um, and, and see this is to the illustrated on the right hand side. Um, you might think that a blurring is not a really a big deal. Um, like uh, astronomers do this all the time. They just invert the point spread function, that's it. And we do that as well in experiments in particle and nuclear physics. But the point, the, the important point is that this blurred, blur, uh, blur or spreading fun point spread function that we have in this case is not really an instrumental uh, effect, but it's rather also coming from uh, physics, which is related to how the quarks fragment into particles, how the, the quarks uh, transform themselves into particles that we measure at the end. Uh, and that is encoded in, in functions that we call fragmentation functions. Those fragmentation functions play the role of this uh, smearing, uh, smearing of the image that we want to take. So that is uh, an issue. Uh, but uh, moreover, so if you have this type of integrals, uh, you can sort of try to break it if you assume a certain shape for the blurring function, the D function that you can see in here. But even if you do that, you end up, uh, instead of having a convolution, you, in, you break this convolution, you end up with products. And so you have two unknowns that are being multiplied that uh, rather naturally leads to a strong correlations. And this is precisely what happens if you try to extract the information out of the convolution, which is shown here. Um, the, you get uh, a rather large correlation between the parameters that you want to extract. And everyone knows that when you have such a strong correlation, then uh, it, at some point it's meaningless to quote a single number because you can just vary that if you vary the two parameters simultaneously. So ideally we want to uh, break this convolution. JETS uh, is precisely one of the ways that can that we can do that. So jets, the promise of jets is that you will get access to just one of these functions in the convolution, but not two of them at the same time. Uh, and that will allow us to do a more uh, precise measurement of, the, of how the quarks are distributed in momentum space inside the proton. 
Uh, there is a second reason why jets are rather crucial for these studies. And they, the answer is that the reason is that not only they match well the struck quark kinematics, but actually they have a rich structure. They are a collection of particles. They are uh, the, that in, that the way that they are, those particles are distributed uh, are also encode rich information. So there are various scales that are involved in a, in a jet that have to do with how exactly those jets get get formed. And by mining that information, we can actually deduce more information about the um, momentum and spin correlations of the initial quarks, and also how those um, fragment into particles that we measured at the end. So this was uh, rather recently uh, proposed, for example, in this paper, um, to, to use jets to measure this uh, the Sievert function, which is the spin orbit correlation of quark inside the proton. Um, the, the, it's a rather novel idea. So this is the, the paper that I'm going to quote. And the, the main uh, message that they have in this paper is that the, the advantage of measuring jets is that you, you don't involve the TMD fragmentation functions, uh, which is this blurring functions that I showed you before in the convolution. You, you will be able to break this convolution. And the observable or the measurement that they proposed is to measure the azimuthal difference between electrons and jets. And by changing the spin state of the proton, uh, that distribution gets uh, shifted a little bit. It, you induce an asymmetry uh, that it can be measured. And so that's what they propose in that paper. So what we did in, in a study uh, that I will show you right now is to look at how well that could be measured the electron ion collider. So we ran some simulations and we did also some uh, theory work to actually predict what level of asymmetry you could expect. One of the, all, the important variables that uh, this study uh, needs, needs is the electron jet imbalance, which is defined here uh, as just this vector sum of the electron momentum and the jet momentum in the transverse plane. This distribution uh, peaks at small values, um, which you can see on the right hand side. So uh, it, it has a peak at the small values and then it has a long tail. So this uh, hasn't been measured, but we compared um, uh, two models, two theory models uh, to try to gauge uh, consistency at least. But this is one of the things that we want to measure, which is a nearly imbalance between the electrons and the jets. And this has two regions. One is a Gaussian-like peak, and at large values, it has like a power law tail. Both of them we should be able to measure and they, they will allow us to really access the uh, transverse momentum um, motion of quarks inside the proton. So we ran the simulations and, and projected what the statistics uh, we can get. We could get at the electron ion collider and, the, and also made theory predictions. And this is what it looks like. So the, this is an asymmetry that can be measured. Uh, is it, basically you turn, you flip the, uh, the spin polarization of the proton, and then you look at the imbalance between the electron and the jet, and that you can define the asymmetry in that way. This is defined here is a few percent. Uh, this is uh, the, the, it's a small effect overall, but the precision of the data is going to be such that uh, we will be able to const constrain this quite well. Uh, so the the error band here um, uh, represents the theory uncertainty of our current knowledge. Of, of this spin orbit effect, which is called the Sievers effect. With the EIC data, we will be able to shrink that quite substantially. And this is just one slice in a very highly dimensional, multi-dimensional phase space. Um, so this is uh, what, what we projected in that paper. Thing that we did in this paper is to look at how we could measure the transfer, transversity, which is a name of a, um, a effect. So you want what is the distribution of transversely polarized quarks inside a transversely polarized nucleon. It's, again, it's a spin-spin effect. And that actually shows up not like in the imbalance between the electron and the jet, but you need to measure how the hadrons inside a jet are distributed. So this is illustrated on the left-hand side. You have a jet, and then you look at the, uh, the particles that are inside a jet, 
And by changing the polarization state of the proton, um, you induce asymmetries in this variable, asymmetrical variables. So that was proposed in these two papers that you can see in here. This has actually been measured in the uh, Rick Collider, which is uh, Brookhaven National Lab, a uh, proton proton collider that actually also had the capability of polarizing the protons. And what they did is to measure this variable and and indeed the asymmetry is non-zero. Uh, they see an evidence for this spin-spin correlation. However, the experimental data has rather large statistical uncertainties. Uh, so this is just the beginning. Uh, uh, and there will be more measurements coming out of a RIC, uh, the RIC proton-proton collider. So what we have uh, Sorry, uh, Miguel, sorry to interrupt yes. you for a second, but we actually had a question that, sure. uh, that came up on the previous slide, but it's actually from two slides ago. And it's from Pavel. Uh, Pavel, you should be able to go ahead and unmute if you want to ask. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, hi, Miguel. Well, no, I just a quick question that when you discuss the uh, measurement of the Sievers effect, and so here we have a large band of the theory uncertainty. What do you exactly mean by that? Is it uh, where it's coming from? Yes, that's a good question. So this uncertainty is um, is coming mainly from the uh, Sievers function itself. So that's the bulk of it. So we uh, that, that and we that's the uncertainty that we expect dominates. There are other uncertainties related to how exactly you calculate this asymmetry, but uh, the Sievers function itself has a rather large uncertainty, and that is just the dominant one. Okay, thanks. And, and this is our, uh, uh, let me just stress that I will make use of uh, your uh, nice question to emphasize that this is even at large x. So for this particular slice that I'm showing you, uh, this is uh, x of 0.16. So it's a, the balance region basically, which is where most of the experimental data of fixed theoretic experiment did tackle, tackle this, um, try to attempt to constrain this function. And even though there are many experiments over many decades, we still have this level of uncertainty in the Sievers function. So even though the, uh, the electron ion collider focus has been towards the low X physics and gluons, in this particular case, even the the balance structure of the proton is still rather unknown. Yeah, well, okay. So uh, I don't want to derail your presentation, but maybe you can come back to this question about, uh, well, this slide and um, after, the, after the presentation, like for example, what's, what's the actual physics that happens here? And so um, um, like, like jets themselves have their own size and, and uh, the, the, the R dependence and uh, whether those issues may play a role here as well. Yes, yes. No, that's, that's a, it's a good question. As I said, there are subtleties that I'm skipping. And the theory framework itself has been put forward in this paper. But, you know, that's that's a discussion that we can have perhaps offline or maybe afterwards. That's a good okay. question. Yeah. Of okay. course, this is, there are details here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me just tell you that in uh, for this hadron in jet measurements, uh, we will have the situation where you can do these measurements at, at proton-proton collisions at RIC and in electron-proton collisions at the EIC. Um, and the comparison between the two uh, will teach us quite a bit about what is really happening and how you can really, you will be able, we will be able to constrain really a much better uh, the theory if you have the two types of collisions. Moreover, in the electron-proton case, uh, you not only have the jet axis to measure azimuthal angles of the hadrons with respect uh, to the jet axis, but you also have another axis because the electron is something we also measure. So we have uh, two different axes, and um, it's a, it's a, even though these are two similar processes and similar observables, the fact that you have two axes uh, makes the theory such that you have better control of what actually uh, you're probing with this type of measurements. So we uh, put, we extended the framework, the framework that was used in here by these two authors uh, that was used to predict what level of asymmetry you could have at RIC uh, rather successfully, they predicted the level of asymmetry. We took that framework or they, because they are my collaborators as the theorist who did this, extended that framework to the electron proton case and we not only did that, but also projected how well you could measure 
uh, th those level, those asymmetries. So this is shown here, again, uh, asymmetry of hadrons inside the jet uh, for both positive pions and negative pions shown in blue and in orange. And uh, the uh, for three different slices in X, three different regions, uh, which are focused mostly at the large X domain. And in here, you can see the asymmetry is expected to be different um, in, in the three cases. And the bottom line is that the error bar is much smaller than the current theory uncertainty, dominated by the uncertainty coming from the um, transversity distribution. So this is spin-spin effect. So we expect that this type of measurements uh, will be possible and also will allow us to con constrain those distributions quite well. Uh, what I have shown you today are mostly digits, uh, uh, sorry, single jets of the electron ion collider, but digit events will also be rather important. So, and this is an example from that digit event. Uh, digits are rather uh, good proxies to get a gluon din a dynamics because you can, uh, one of the ways that you produce digits is by involving gluons, uh, scattering out of gluons in the pro in the diagrams, the, for example, you, you see on the upper right panel. Um, so by measuring these two jets uh, precisely, uh, you can act actually measure the gluon densities. And so how are the gluons distributed in both momentum and position space? So this has been studied and uh, for example, in this paper, a uh, recent paper and um, after a series of studies of both experimental uh, considerations and also uh, theory um, uh, considerations, they concluded that the digit channel by measuring jets, um, you actually uh, have the better shot, uh, the better uh, chance of actually measuring the gluon uh, Sievers function. So this uh, spin orbit effect for gluons that is completely or basically unconstrained at the moment. So the, with the EAC, by measuring this type of events. Uh, we will be able to know. Moreover, if you actually um, uh, look for uh, ch charm jets, uh, uh, you can actually constrain that uh, quite well as well. So and this is one example of charm jets uh, where you can, it's, it's, it's a great handle in the gluon dynamics. Uh, we also uh, did a study, uh, this is in collaboration with um, with uh, many of you who are in the audience, like uh, Fred and Steve and, uh, and Tim, um, th that we studied what, what you could do with charged current interactions. So in this situation, you have, rather than the electron going in and the electron going out, you have an electron that uh, is transformed into a neutrino by exchange for W. Uh, this type of process, you can um, actually gain flavor sensitivity. Basically, you can control uh, or you can get a, a handle on, on what type of quark you scatter off. Uh, so this uh, process is more uh, challenging because you have a neutrino in the final state that you cannot really measure directly, but it can be measured if you measure all particles in the event and then make use of the fact that there is energy conservation and momentum conservation. And so you can uh, reconstruct the direction of the neutrino. Um, by measuring basically uh, the missing energy uh, in a hermetic detector. So this is what I'm illustrated here, illustrating here. So in principle, you could do the, those studies by the similar studies to what I showed you, but looking at the neutrino and the jet. Um, we did also study uh, if you, on top of having a neutrino in the final state, you look for the, the charm jet, uh, charm uh, jet that has a feature that produces displaced vertices, particles that are displaced from the interaction point. Uh, you can uh, control what level, uh, what flavor of the of the quark you scattered off uh, in the proton. And in this case, in particular, if you, if you require charm jets, you access strange jets. And so that will allow you uh, uh, to really um, uh, illuminate what is the role of the strange quarks inside the proton, which is uh, a, an area of active uh, uh, investigation. They, and so the EAC data will allow us to really pin that down, as you can see from these two plots that show a ratio of two different hypotheses uh, between what is the value of the strange 
what, what is the distribution of the strange quarks inside the proton between two extreme scenarios. The experimental uncertainty that we projected is in the band. Uh, so the, that is much smaller than the ratio. So we will be able to tell uh, with rather good confidence what, what is the true answer. Um, let me just check my time. I think I need to uh, hurry up. Um, what one of the things that I want to emphasize is that um, jets at the electron ion collider, um, sorry, jets at the at, at the at any collider, the HERA and at the electron ion collider, can be produced in a variety of ways. So this is illustrated in these Feynman diagrams you can see in here. So on the, at the first order in the in the theory, uh, you get a struck quark um, being. Uh, uh, ejected or uh, scatter of uh, a proton, but on the higher order terms in the theory, you have multi-jets, multi-jet events that are produced in these more complicated diagrams. At HERA, most of the time, people focused on the multi-jet configuration because that is what gives you access to gluons. But at the EAC is going to be different because we also care about the leading order diagram that gives you access to quarks, the quark densities. So rather than being a background, which is was, was considered most of the time at HERA, uh, it will be actually a golden channel to do studies of quarks, quark densities inside the proton. So this is something which I, I am doing right now at the moment is to actually reanalyzing data from HERA experiments and, and now uh, take that into a, a new look uh, or a, a new framework, which is this, uh, the goal would be to extract what is the quark transverse momentum dependent distributions inside the proton. And so you can see here some preliminary, not even preliminary, but work in progress using this new data, uh, all data with new theory uh, motivation. So this is just one example. Uh, I'm showing you here another example in which uh, you can uh, measure the azimuthal difference between electrons and jets, and not only do that, but actually change the definition of jet, because jet uh, depends on how you define it. And, and there are different ways. And by changing the way how you define that is, uh, is, is called um, jet, is, is, one of the, is one of the ways that you can explore jet substructure. Um, so these are is shown here, two examples of, of HERA data, but just looking at the, at the correlation between electrons and these jets defined in different ways. And uh, in every case, you see a peak at, at pi uh, at that changes the strength of which changes with the kinematics of the event. Uh, but by changing the definition, you actually change that correlation as well. And that we think we, it will tell us how uh, the, it, teaches, it teaches us about uh, the transverse momentum dynamics inside the, inside the jet. Um, but the, the idea of actually uh, measuring these single jet events is tricky because as I said before, this hasn't been measured. Um, how do we study these jets in this configuration where you have uh, one jet in the final state? So if you put yourself in the frame in which you align with the virtual photon, uh, which is, goes by the technical name of bright frame, you see a jet that is going at very small angles. And that unfortunately, um, or fortunately, um, the jet algorithms that were used at HERA and are typically used in colliders don't work. Uh, they will just not be able to measure that jet simply because um, the jet, um, the distance between the two particles will just go to infinity. That has to do with the fact that we use rapidity instead of angles for the definition of the jet distance, uh, the, the distance used to define the jet. And when you go to very small angles, the rapidity goes to infinity. So the distance between particles inside the jet just diverges. Uh, so what we need is an alternative an alternative jet algorithm, and you have two alternatives. One is the ones that are used in, e in electron proton colliders that is defined here. And we also propose a new algorithm which is tailored to the deep inelastic scattering. So these two formulas that are shown here. It, 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 I don't expect you to get uh, uh, anything from these uh, formulas because they are uh, complicated, but uh, this is a better visualization of what's going on. You have three different ways that you can define the algorithm. And here I'm showing you the jet area, how the jet area changes if you change the polar angle 
of, of the jet in this particular frame. And on the left-hand side, I show you the typical algorithms that are used at proton-proton colliders that were used at HERA. The area shrinks as you go to forward angles simply because uh, that is a fixed rapidity uh, and that the rapidity distance just uh, decreases. And and uh, when you go to, on the right-hand side, this is not a feature that is, is present in the electron-positron uh, electron uh, algorithms. Those have uh, large areas at forward angles, and that can actually capture this forward-going jet. And what we propose in, is something in between these two extremes. It has the ability to capture the jet in one direction, but uh, the area shrinks in the other direction. And that's precisely what you want um, uh, if you want to measure the jets that are going in, in, in a direction that you already know. So this algorithm has different features that I, I'm not going to discuss today, but they are uh, complementary. Uh, so let me just finish by saying that um, the, looking at the jet substructure, uh, how the particles inside the jet uh, are actually distributed, uh, will actually tell us uh, about how the quarks and gluons are distributed or what is the transfer momentum dynamics of the quarks and gluons. There is already literature on this subject. Um, so depending on using jet techniques that were developed by our colleagues in high energy physics, we can import some of that, adapt some of that, but actually with the goal of studying how quarks and gluons are distributed inside the quarks and gluons. And what is neat about the uh, EIC detectors is that they will really be unlike any other detector in history of collider history, in the sense that they will combine uh, ability to look for the particle of each, like to identify which particle, um, uh, like uh, to have a particle identification system. So we will be able to tell which which particle is a kaon or a, a pion or a proton and that up to a very high momentum. And that is not something that has been uh, done in a collider experiment. And moreover, we ha have those type of detectors, PID detectors, uh, coupled with full calorimetry system. So the combination is just calling for new jet measurements that will exploit the uh, particle identification capability of these uh, EIC detectors. And there, are, there is already literature on this subject on how to exploit this, but I expect many more studies will be done. So to summarize, this is my last slide. Uh, so the jets at the EAC will be unlike any previous collider, even HERA. That's something to keep in mind. And the number of uh, studies for jets at the EAC has uh, increased dramatically over the last few years. And now we are fully uh, discussing and exploring the possibilities of what these new experiments at the electron ion collider will uh, 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 give us. Um, and in summary, jets are really a powerful tool, will offer a powerful tool for the quantum tomography of the proton. And I want to finalize by invite, inviting you uh, to join to this online workshop that uh, I'm giving you here the uh, link in which we are going to discuss this and, and related subjects. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you very much, Miguel. We're gonna to try to give you a little bit of applause here at the end, so there we go. Zoom does a terrible job of that. <laughs> this Thank is you. about the best we can do. <laughs> That's okay. All right, Thank you. so let's, uh, let's go ahead and open it up to questions now. Um, if you have a question, just type the word speak in the chat. So take a moment. I have a few things here in case there's no obvious candidates right away. All right, Pavel, excellent. Let's go back to you and you should be able to unmute. All right. Uh, Hi, Miguel. Well, uh, this is a very, very nice talk. Um, uh, I have a question about this definition of the special um, jet, um, uh, uh, jet jet definition, um, the, the Centauro one. Um, uh, well, uh, if you look at the, if you go to the bright frame, so uh, the assume the polar angle has uh, more similarity to the transverse momentum rather than to the rapidity in the Julian process. So you can uh, imme immediately write that the log of, of theta is really a QT over Q. So therefore the question to you is, uh, if, wh why would you um, use this analogy between the rapidity in theta rather than uh, the transverse momentum in theta in this case? Uh, you know, that's, yeah, that's a good question. So the, the, my point is that we shouldn't use rapidity precisely because 
simply like in, in a way that is uh, the reason is related to what you said and uh, rapidity is not the correct variable uh, for this particular configuration. I, I'm just saying that the typical JET algorithms, so the ones that were used at HERA and the ones that were used at proton, proton collisions or are being used, they use rapidity and therefore they are disqualified to uh, for the purpose. So they, they use rapidity, so therefore we cannot really cluster that JET going very forward rapidity. So you really want the angles and energies. And that is what the uh, electron positron collision um, algorithms use. So they use energies and angles. So that mm -hmm. works out. Uh, the uh, the un unfortunate feature of those algorithms is that uh, they are spherically invariant rather than being longitudinally invariant. Um, and longitudinally invariance is rather important in proton proton collisions. And it's also important, we believe, in deep inelastic scattering, because it's not deep inelastic scattering. Uh, electron proton collisions are not symmetric. They are not spherically symmetric like the electron proton collision. Uh, they are asymmetric. And, and moreover, you can exploit the longitudinal invariance for some uh, studies, um, in particular, because if you define the transverse momentum in, in any frame, it will be the same because the, 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 the algorithm will be longitudinally invariant. So it will be invariant under boost in the C direction. And that's, that's a feature that the, this new algorithm has. That being said though, uh, we believe that both of, the, uh, both of the algorithms that you can see in this figure, the middle and the right uh, algorithm will play an important role uh, to study the jets and, and in this kinematics that I'm showing you above. Um, both of them are complementary, and um, let me just use your question to show you some um, some studies that one could do in principle with these two algorithms. Uh, you could measure the jet energy and that is defined uh, here um, mm -hmm. that peaks at at at, at, the, at large values like at at one. Um, mm -hmm. This is the energy relative to the photon energy, and uh, you can also study the transverse momentum of the jet. And you can study that with both uh, the uh, the e plus e minus algorithm and the Centaur algorithm. And there are subtle differences between the two, uh, but in principle, both of them work. But the important thing is that the only the Centaur will give you a longitudinal invariant um, definition of the transverse momentum because the e plus e minus algorithm is symmetrically invariant, spherically invariant, uh, so if you do a boost, if you choose to do, to follow to work in a different frame, uh, it will give you a different answer, and that is something you may not want to have as a feature. I hope that answers your question, Paul. Yeah, and uh, it is infrared safe uh, when you go to the next leading order. Uh, that's a good question. I I you know I don't I don't know I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. I yeah, I will try to follow that up. Yeah, because for theorists, it will be very important to have it infrared safe. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I suspect I suspect it is. So this is by definition uh, is is by by construction. Let's say um, uh, by construction, it follows the 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 a plus and minus algorithm in the forward direction. So at least there, it has the same properties as the uh, other e plus e minus algorithm. Yeah, but but, I, but again, I think what what uh, the re the reason I ask this question is because um, in the way it is structured, so this variable theta, right? So so uh, is really more like the equivalent of kT rather than uh, or ra rather than the rapidity in the Drillian process. But anyway, this is probably more technical than what what, what we want to discuss now, and uh, very interesting that you, you are thinking about it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, Tim, we uh, have a question from you. So go ahead, you should be able to unmute. All right, so can anyone hear Tim? I see he's unmuted, but I don't actually hear him speaking. All right, give me a second here. Let me make this easier for him. I'm gonna make you a co-host, Tim because it sounds like you had microphone problems and that way I don't have to keep giving you permission to unmute. Um, while we're waiting for Tim to sort that out, um, let's go to Rob Calkin. So Rob, you should be able to unmute. Let's do your question. We'll come back to Tim. 
Sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes, indeed. Perfect. So actually, I kind of an experimental question. So going to the, the proposed um, EIC detectors. So is are so is this what sort of things are what has the theory community put forward a list of requirements? Because I imagine that you really want a very um, granulated uh, calorimeter for this, something along the lines of of like the Cali's project that's been proposed for the ILs for the ILC. And you know what sort of uh, resolution, angular resolution, and, and pseudo rapidity or rapidity would you would you actually need? And I I suppose that this largely will rely on good forward tracking and, and particle flow algorithms. Yes, that's that's a great question. Let me let me answer the first part. Uh, so indeed, uh, the commu EIC community um, as as as. So the EAC community is working on a set of requirements in, with physics. Um, so we are writing so um, like um, yellow report that will have those uh, specification requirements that are needed. So uh, several uh, of 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 the people uh, on the call uh, are are contributing to that effort, like um, Fred and Steve and Tim. So that is ongoing. Uh, but that's the first answer. The second answer is related to the calorimetry. Uh, so one, so I, one of the issues with the particle flow calorimetry is that uh, the energies that we will have at the EIC are not super high. They're actually low in for in, in the the big picture uh, uh, of all the colliders that you can imagine. Uh, so it's up to a hundred GeV of center of mass energy. 150, 40. Uh, so we think that the uh, those uh, techniques uh, will uh, will not really uh, work as well as they could work at high energy colliders. And moreover, uh, be, be, because just the energy of the jets is much smaller. Uh, actually, let me show you something. Uh, Moreover, uh, we run simulations and without these highly segmented calorimeters, but just having um, uh, regular uh, calorimeters, uh, uh, you could get a rather good energy resolution for the jets that will also be good for um, the measurements that I just described to you not only the jet energy resolution, but also the imbalance between the electron and the jet. This is shown here in the two performance plots. Uh, so in that sense, this super, uh, the great particle flow calorimeters are not going to be necessary in, in my estimation. Uh, they might be actually an overkill for the energies that are involved in here. But what we will use is not the particle flow algorithm, but the energy flow algorithm, which is of course like, um, a more crude version of that. So we will combine tracks and energy in the calorimeter systems, but not, not like tracking each particle, but rather the way that it, this, this is a method that was done at Aleph at LEP uh, in which they combine tracks with calorimeters and it has been uh, used in other experiments as well. So this is similar to what CMS does, which is not really fully achieving the particle flow uh, fundamental limit uh, that you're referring to, uh, but rather something in between. If you have that something in between, it's good enough for uh, the energies that are involved in the electron ion collider and the type of uh, angular resolutions that we need to perform these measurements. I hope that answers you, your question. If not, you, you just let me know. No, it sounds good. It sounds like you don't need to spend all the money to build build something that 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 uh, complex. Yeah, yes, yes, uh, that's true. But on the other hand, uh, there are other areas uh, which uh, perhaps will play uh, a, a more more crucial aspect. So I don't think the the calorimeters need to be top notch, but the stem and the tracker really really have to be superb uh, to really get out most of the data. Uh, most physics out of the data. So I think that's going to be the crucial aspect, the PAD and tracker. 
Okay, and we have Tim back. We have two Tims. So yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, Excellent. great. Very good. Sorry about that before. So um, yeah, Miguel, thanks for the very nice talk. My question is quite simple. Um, so with what you were showing before related to the single jet production and constraints to the sivers asymmetry or extractions of the sivers function, um, you were just essentially comparing bands to projected uncertainties. Have any actual impact studies been done up to this point? And if so, you know, in the context of what framework and if not, um, do you know what the prospects for doing this um, might actually be? Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, indeed, so far, we, what we have done is to compare the, the, the theory error band with the projected statistical error band. Um, that going from this to actually doing an impact study of, of how the Sievers function will be constrained, that is a one step further. And that indeed requires development on the theory framework and a much more detailed studies, as, as you know very well. And the, the fact is that we don't have that at the moment. In principle, that could be done. Uh, so this is the framework that it was put forward by uh, Liu et al. in this PRL uh, of, of two years ago. And so in principle, we have that framework, but now, uh, of course, there are issues with um, with with uh, to how precise those calculations are in the sense of a uh, perturbation series, uh, that is, I presume, is not fully settled, um, which is why we didn't attempt to do an impact study, uh, but rather um, a more humble goal was to really show that uh, the experimental band is much smaller, and you could, in principle, do those measurements. We did simulations to convince ourselves that you you could do that. And so that was the goal of this of this study. We don't have impact studies yet, formal impact studies. Yeah, I understand. I mean, that's that's reasonable enough. And I guess the other aspect is exactly which um, current data are really informing this band that you that you show, for instance, on this slide. Um, but yeah, it, it will be interesting to know going forward. Um, yeah, no, the the I I believe they can answer that. So the 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 data is uh, all this data from Compass, Hermes, and JLF. That is uh, the there are people who have extracted uh, is motive from Compass and Hermes. Uh, people have extracted sievers functions and 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 that is the the current the current. Um, knowledge that is expressed in this band. This is one of the extractions, but there are several extractions and all of them have either very similar error bands or much larger error bands. And these are rather current ones. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's to give you an idea of the ballpark of what the uncertainty is, but of course there are different groups that have done these extractions and, and the answer can differ. We didn't put many of them in here just for not to clutter the blood. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Miguel. Thank you. Yeah, hi, hi, hi Miguel. Well, if, if I could just follow up on this discussion of the Sievers function. Well, uh, for, for those uh, in the audience who don't know what, what, what's special about this function. So for many, for many years, people thought that it is impossible because it changes sign of, and under the reversal of time. And this was not, it was considered not possible for the uh, inoperability function describing the initial state. Um, but then, uh, well, uh, a few years ago, it was shown that, in fact, such a function can exist, but only because of the peculiar property of interaction between the uh, initial part, uh, hadronic state and uh, the soft radiation that exists in the process. Uh, but th this kind of um, uh, the, the proof that the subfunction can be non-zero was shown really for a, one particle in the final state. And so here we talk about jet, jet production, which contains many particles. So the question to Miguel, uh, well, I don't know if perhaps, if it is possible to, to tell us what would be the physical mechanism that would give rise to such a non-zero contribution in this case? Uh, I think it's the same. I, you know, that's a good question. I, let me just get, get a sense. I perhaps I didn't include it in the backup. Um, now, unfortunately, they didn't include the details on that paper, the Lou et al. paper. I had a summary slide somewhere. Uh, but uh, that is actually described 
this is described um uh, uh this is described in this paper and i you know i cannot explain to you uh, in 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 a, in 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 detail, uh, what is the reason why this also works for jets? Uh, this is I would refer you to this uh, publication, yeah. okay. and this, this and all and, and and there is also another one uh, which um, uh, that proposes the, the 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 same measurement but in the bright frame. That's uh, the theory changes a bit, uh, but it's the same idea that by measuring the jets you can constrain the sievers function. Well, um, yeah, I, I know. I, and again, there are this quote very so obviously very technical and sort of Sarah uh, papers, but but I was just wondering uh, if there is a simple physical picture that you could say, okay, well, this is what will happen in my process uh, with the let's see event structure that I will have such an effect. And uh, I, I believe I believe that is the same that you described that the that the uh, there is a subsequent in soft interactions right. between this the quark struck quark and the. And the remnant of the proton, I think that that is breaks this uh, this effect that you described at, in the beginning of your question. So okay. I think it's just the same idea, and that is independent of whether you measure at the end one particle or all particles, because that is an effect that is really coming from the quark at the quark level. It's the quark which is interacting with the remnants of the of the of the proton, mm -hmm. even rise to this effect. So what happens afterwards in the fragmentation of that quark is, is not relevant for the Sievers function itself, uh, which is why jets are a good proxy or a good way to measure that because it's like um, integrating what happens after the, the quark fragments. OK. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, hope, I hope you will be able to measure it. That looks very interesting. Yeah, no, I think it, it, I think it looks, it looks uh, promising either Either uh, fr from both the theory and the experimental side, everything looks all right. Even if you do, if we are not able to measure the imbalance, which is a QT variable, we for sure will be able to measure the um, the, the the azimuthal angle dis distance between the jet and the electron. This is something that I, I will use again your question to emphasize something, which in here the the distance between the error bands, the distance between the data points is rather large so we will be able we think we will be able to measure this but not in a very differential way simply because the bin width has to be large because the resolutions on this variable are not super great it's rather difficult to measure this precisely mm -hmm. and so um uh, this comes to to that point this is a challenge to measure this variable but there are other variables that we could in principle measure better like the just the azimuthal angle well, I guess so, so. Sorry, Steve. I, I I don't know if we need to disconnect. I can stop. But the, the, again, the uh, well, the possible issue is to prove that you this simple factorization into let's say the initial state and the final state, which is described by another kind of um, function called the Collins function, uh, works in this case. And I don't know if you guys also thought about that, uh, whether you are indeed measuring the initial state effect rather than the final state effect of some mix. Yeah, yeah, no, they, 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 they claim, and I think I have a, a quote uh, from their paper, they, their claim is that uh, they, I don't know what's going on, my mouse is not, uh, here, so the, 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 the claim is that there, there are no fragmentation functions involved, so that's their claim, and uh, now there are no, that doesn't mean that it's a purely perturbative calculation, but rather you have other functions like jet functions that have that are purely perturbative, but there are, there is another non-perturbative aspect to the calculation, which is encoded into soft functions. Uh, so overall, this is tricky. I mean, the, I am skipping some details, of course, here, but uh, the, the the promise is that you will get a better access to the initial state uh, than if you just measured one particle at a time. Okay. Okay, thank you. Great, no, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions that people would like to ask? I don't see anyone else queued up in the chat window. All right, Miguel, I think you've burned out our audience. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. And thank I you very much. 
Yeah, great. Yeah, and I, I think we can go ahead and wrap up here. So you have a good afternoon slash evening, Miguel. And uh, thanks to everybody else. I hope everyone's staying staying safe and keeping busy as the semester wraps up. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Miguel. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. All right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm.